So I've got an interesting one here. I wanted to get this on film just because this is one of the weirder things that I've seen. Um, this is a Fender uh, Blues Deluxe and it was really dirty, came in, you'd flip the power on, there was nothing. Uh, all the tubes were lighting up, so I pulled the back off. <laughs> now, of course, my light just died. Oh, there we go. If you look right here, these are the wires coming off the secondary of the output transformer. And with all the other evidence that's in here, um, looks like mice have chewed through, like all the way through. Um, the secondary winding on the output transformer and they chewed through some of the other wiring here even on the primary side um, but yeah it's just a complete mess in there so uh, yeah I just wanted to sort of show that because one of the crazier things that I've seen normally um, there's no signal coming out of an amp you'd sort of suspect one of the tubes um, but this wasn't blowing the fuse uh, there was absolutely no hiss through the speaker nothing so that's why I want to open it up and uh, yeah nuts so I mean some of these amps you never know how they've been treated or what's going on so you always want to take a look what a mess though so uh, this amp is one that I got back and I, I filmed a short thing with it uh, quite a while ago when it came in the first time. Uh, this is an amp that had a bunch of uh, mouse damage, we'll say. Mouse, rats, chipmunks, whatever. They stripped a bunch of insulation off the wiring and chewed stuff up and just left a mess in here. And so this is sort of the second, second look at it. So this time around, going more in depth with it, uh, there were a number of issues <laughs> that, that didn't really make sense at the time. Um, so first thing, well, before when it was in the first time, I checked all the caps and everything. All those tested good. These IC caps from this uh, generation in the earlier 90s, uh, for whatever reason, they seemed to last a lot better than when they actually went to the Hot Rod Series amps. Uh, I checked the diodes. There's another video I've got on uh, the output transformer diodes. Those um, to drain any sort of voltage spikes or anything like that. Uh, check those. Those were actually good on this amp. No issues there. Capacitors check out fine. Um, something I've mentioned probably in one of the other videos, these uh, resistors here for the 16 volt rails that power your ICs. Um, check those. They were sort of out of spec and it wasn't very balanced on the 16 volts so, and those old ones were sort of cracked and you know chipping away. So I replaced both of those while I had the board out. But the final two parts to the final piece of the puzzle with this amp. Um, so with this amp, there's 100 UF capacitors as your initial input caps uh, for the power supply. And the weird thing with these amps is that these 100 UF, uh, they're in series. And if you look at the schematic diagram, um, it's sort of odd the way that they run, like this one's in series with this cap, this cap's in series with this one, or some very, maybe it's this one and this one, this one, whichever. Um, but they sort of jump over like that. Uh, and in between each of those, you'll see there's 220K, um, 220K resistors, and they're also hooked to ground, and those are drain resistors. However, in this configuration, <laughs> you can kind of get an odd thing. So on both rails, there was one 220k resistor on both rails uh, that was actually burned out completely dead. It was uh, not passing anything. It was infinite resistance. Um, and one was on the was the first one, and the uh, on the other set of caps, it was the second one. So it was causing this weird thing where that when you'd uh, sort of drag the amp down when you're hitting low notes. Um, the power supply wasn't quite keeping up. It was sort of odd because, I mean, really those those resistors, uh, they're there mainly just to drain the caps. It's sort of a, a safety thing. But because of the odd way that they, the odd configuration that they failed in, um, they were actually causing this weird cross bleed thing. But anyway, so that was one part of the issue. And the other ones, the other 220Ks that were in there were out of spec anyway. So I just replaced all of those. Because again, you have to take the whole this whole board out. Um, in order to address that issue. 
So, uh, and on top of that, the other thing to keep in mind is with these boards, all of these amps from the 90s, for whatever reason, when they get this old and they've gone through a bunch of heating and cooling cycles, when you go to desolder components, um, some of the copper traces literally just dissolve, uh, if not get pulled off the board just from your solder wick or whatever. So be prepared to run some jumpers. And uh, I did have to run some jumpers and some extra wire and stuff in behind to sort of make up any damaged traces. Um, so on this one, even after the power supply issue, like it, it got better, but it still sort of sounded like garbage. It would do this weird thing where you'd get like, the, the transient to the note would be clean and clear, but as the note would ring, uh, it would have this fuzzy sort of subtle distortion uh, to it. And you hear people throw around terms like, oh, it sounds out of phase, or it sounds like there's a phase issue. Uh, oftentimes they use that term incorrectly to identify what they're hearing. But this was uh, an actual phase issue that you could hear. So with the power supply issues addressed, when you hit a note, it would sort of, like I say, you get the transient, but then it's the rest, it was after that, you'd get this weird fuzziness to it. Um, and it would sort of, you could almost sort of hear that there was a fuzziness to it, but then a clean portion to the, uh, so whatever note you were hitting. So that to me spells it phase issue. So I started checking the phase inverter because that's where um, you're getting split into you know two signals for each of your power tubes. And lo and behold, on pin six, no voltage at all. Trace it back and there's a 100K resistor that supplies uh, that plate. So uh, on the side going to the tube, nothing. But on the other side, coming into that 100K re resistor, there was voltage. So we know that the 100K is no good. Replace that and boom, all of a sudden amp is performing the way that it should. Tubes are much better balanced and uh, you know plenty of power. Now you get it up to four or five and it's shaking the wall so that's what we want. So why I wanted to go into this on this one is because um, sometimes when you have a big job like repairing a bunch of mouse damage um, on an output transformer that's a job that takes a while. It can be sort of fiddly. You got to figure out how to get around certain things. There's, you know, any number of issues uh, besides just the obvious ones that you might be addressing in the amp. Sometimes you need to take time away uh, from a project like this. You know, do the main things that you think are wrong. And it, if it's not performing the way that it is, and you're sort of out of ideas, uh, put it to the side. Go on. Do something else, and you can always come back to it. Uh, in this case, I kind of needed to do that with that amp because this amp, because taking a fresh look at it, um, it was fairly obvious to go through um, and start testing things and figure out exactly where the problem was, especially given the work that I had already done. And the other thing is too that um, you've got to be really careful not to get too complacent when you're working on pieces of gear like this in terms of, oh, I'm just going to do this and this and it'll be a quick repair. Um, sometimes you have to go through, you have to remember your troubleshooting um, steps, your troubleshooting methodology, and go through that every single time. You know, if the amp isn't performing the way that it should be, if it sort of sounds fuzzy and whatnot, assume that there's something wrong with the power supply. Now, isolating it to a particular part of the circuit, like I talked about endlessly, um, that's another thing. You start with one point, start testing stuff, and if it doesn't work out, then you move on to the next most likely suspect. And the thing is too, with these, uh, so with the deluxe, uh, the Blues Deluxe amps and the Hot Rod Series amps, in their schematics, Fender does something really odd is that in a lot of places, other than the uh, main input power supply, they list a bunch of AC voltages, which is very weird. Uh, you know, there'll be things like uh, four and a half volts AC, five volts AC, like around the phase inverter. Um, I don't find these particularly helpful because in any of these amps, they seem to be wildly inconsistent as to <laughs> where there's AC voltage and where there's not. So um, I wouldn't rely on that. If you're working on tube amps, you know, you should get a general sense of what the DC voltages are. You know, for most preamp tubes, they can be a little under 200 volts. Um, well, you know, I've seen anything from uh, 140 up to 230. Um, you know, possibly higher if you're dealing with uh, reverb uh, driver tubes and stuff like that. But, you know, around the 200 range, 170 
to 210 or 220 uh, on your plates for your, your preamp tubes is sort of in the general range. You know, 6L6s, you should sort of start to build a, a mental map for yourself that, you know, uh, they should be running in these amps anyway, uh, usually around 430 volts more or less. Uh, depends on how the bias is set in them, but you know, you sort of get a general sense of what things should be, what parameters sh things should be operating under, and you go through and you start testing one section at a time. You know, start at your tube sockets. If you're getting weird readings, then you start going backwards through the circuit. Uh, if everything's fine, then you know you move on to your next section.